Hello, everyone. It's the Michael Shermer Show. Here's your host, Michael Shermer. Before I introduce today's guest, our supporter and sponsor, advertiser, Wondrium. You know Wondrium, a series of college-level audio and video courses and documentaries produced and distributed by The Teaching Company. Wondrium brings you engaging educational content through short-form videos, long-form courses, tutorials, how-to lessons, travelogues, documentaries, and more, covering every topic you've ever wondered about and many you never thought you'd wonder about. So here's how it works. You, it's a subscription service, and if you subscribe through the podcast, you get a free trial plus 20% off the annual subscription rate. It's a great deal. I use it all the time. You just I have it on my phone. Just touch on the app as usual. Uh, here's one, Disorders of the Brain. Let's check that out. Let me touch that. 24 lectures. Understanding Disorders of the Brain from Autism to Alzheimer's. Learn about brain diseases and disorders in these 24 captivating lessons. Okay, here's a few of them. Uh, anatomy and functioning of the brain. Good to know how it works. Neuropsychological assessment. Autism Spectrum Disorders, Parts 1 and 2, Developmental Dyslexia, Epilepsy, Mitochondrial Disorders, Head Injuries, Parts 1 and 2, Multiple Sclerosis, Brain Tumors, Huntington's, ALS, Parkinson's 1 and 2, Stroke, Parts 1 and 2, Alzheimer's, Parts 1 and 2. Oh my gosh, how many things can go wrong in your brain? A lot, right? So if those of us that don't have any of these, uh, you know, we are fortunate for sure. But I'm going to listen to these because it's good to know, and particularly from uh, my position, what I do for a living is trying to understand why people believe and do weird things. A lot of it is explained by misfirings of the brain. Anyway, check it out. Go to wondrium.com slash Shermer to get your free trial and the 20% discount and dive right in. Why would you not want to continue subscribing? It's such a great service. Good way to invest your uh, multitasking time by listening to great content. All right, check it out. Here's our episode. My guest today is Yoram Hazani, an award-winning political theorist. He's chairman of the Edmund Burke Foundation in Washington and the president of the Herzl Institute in Jerusalem. His previous book, The Virtue of Nationalism, was named Conservative Book of the Year for 2019 by the Intercollegiate Studies Institute and has been translated into half a dozen languages. He appears frequently in the U.S. media, including the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Fox News, CNN, NPR, Time, The New Republic, The Ben Shapiro Show, and The Rubin Report. A graduate of Princeton University in Rutgers, where he got his BA and PhD, respectively. Hazani lives in Jerusalem with his wife and children. Here's the new book. It's called Conservatism, A Rediscovery. Indeed, uh, I would say that was uh, an interesting subtitle because you seem to be arguing that it's time for conservatives to, well, conserve the original conservatism rather than whatever it is you think they're practicing now. So maybe that's a good place to start after you give us just a little brief background. Who are you? Where'd you come from? What, you know, did you have some um, mentors in college that led you into this career choice? And, and especially, why do you live in, in Israel? <laughs> oh, that's a lot of different things. Yep. Uh, let's... Uh... Uh, let, let's let's begin with I uh, I, I grew up uh, in an Israeli family. I was born in Israel. I grew up in an Israeli family. My father was uh, uh, was teaching at Princeton, and uh, so I, um, you know, fr from from a very early age, I was uh, exposed to a kind of um, a tension between um, my uh, my my Israeli life and uh, my Israeli home life and and. Uh, uh, and the American surroundings. Uh, in in the end, it turned out that um, that much of what I was getting from my father was uh, uh, was what Americans called conservatism. And in in fact, uh, conservatism meaning a uh, a uh, a point of view that sees uh, religious and national tradition as being the key to. Uh, maintaining and uh, maintaining, sustaining, and building up a nation. And um, my father was uh, very, very critical of of uh, the direction the United States was uh, going. He 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 felt that there was uh, a, 
a, a lack of an understanding of what it requires to sustain and transmit ideas and institutions and, and, and behaviors from one generation to the next. And he was very much afraid that, uh, that America was, was uh, uh, going the way of the Roman Empire and, and, and talked about that quite a bit. Now, uh, he was a physicist, uh, physicist, trained as a physicist, teaching computers, and, uh, and he, didn't, you know, he didn't direct me to uh, read uh, books and magazines about political things. He just had opinions about everything. And these opinions turned out to be very conservative opinions. And when, when, uh, when Reagan uh, ran for office, ran for the presidency in 1980, when I was in high school, um, he, uh, you know, I, I came home one day and I, I, I said to my father, look, this, this fellow believes everything you believe. And uh, that, that, that was kind of the, the beginning of my, uh, my encounter with, uh, uh, with uh, conservatism. Um, I, uh, at the same time, I, I, I write in the book that I was also um, uh, seeking as, you know, kind of part of a, uh, um, a, a broad religious and nationalist revival that was going on. I, I, I went to Princeton. That's where I met my wife. And uh, on the Princeton campus during the Reagan Thatcher years, there, there was a, uh, a, a, a broad religious nationalist revival that was taking place. Um, it was, you know, uh, Catholic kids finding their, their Catholicism and Protestant kids finding their Protestantism and Jewish kids returning to Judaism. Um, and uh, uh, among... Some of those uh, the, those Jewish kids, there were, there was an idealism also to um, uh, to uh, to go to Israel and uh, study there. A lot of us ended up uh, uh, living in Israel. Uh, why why do we live in Israel? Well, to begin with, there's um, there's this small matter of the fact that uh, uh, that that in the Bible God repeatedly promises that He's going to going to bring us back. Uh, to, to Israel, and, and it's very difficult to be a serious Jew and not um, and and not hear that call. I mean, I think I think even many Jews who decide to stay in America or in other countries, I think they 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 do hear that call, and they are uh, are torn about it. Um, my my wife and I we we decided that we didn't want our children to be torn about it, and and uh, so uh, we 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 moved to to, to Israel after. Uh, after uh, uh, graduate school, and um, uh, raised, uh, we've raised nine children now. Now three grandchildren. There, the grandchildren are new. Um, so that that that's roughly the story. During during all of those years, uh, I got to know uh, two intellectual traditions reasonably well. The 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 Jewish. The tradition on the one hand, and the Anglo-American tradition on the other, and um, uh, for a long time, I thought the most important thing for me to do would be to write about Judaism, and uh, and that's that's what I did for decades, um, to uh, writing and teaching about Judaism and about the Bible, mostly to Jews. But um, in recent years, I've I've come to feel that. Uh, that America and Europe are in are rapidly deteriorating, and I, I, I've I've come to feel just that it was it, it it it's irresponsible for anyone who can do something about it to uh, stand on the sidelines. And so for the last um, five or six years, uh, I've I, I've been working to put my thoughts about. Uh, the Anglo-American conservative tradition in, 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 into writing and uh, uh, organizing like-minded people uh, in, in, in meetings to try to do something to stem the tide. Mm. Did I hear you right? You have nine children? Yeah, that's right. Why? Not, 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 nine children, two, two, two are married, and a third, thank God, God willing, is getting married this summer. <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, so we're getting I married. Have- I have two kids. That feels like a lot. Why do you have nine kids? Um, well, again, to begin with, the, the sort of the uh, the most basic answer, uh, the, there's a commandment in the Bible that, that tells uh, man to be fruitful and multiply. <laughs> so you and, took that literally. Uh, 
I mean, it, 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 <laughs> That's great. yeah, it's more, it's a little bit more, it, it's more articulate than, than that. It's the, 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 uh, this line in Genesis, which uh, uh, Jews interpret as a commandment, um, is a, a, a blessing to be fruitful and multiply and fill, fill the earth uh, and conquer it. Uh, so it's, it, 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 it's a, a very poetic aspiration for, you know, for, for man's station in the world. <laughs> That's funny. I was hoping you'd give me the line um, that... With, uh, with I was hoping you'd give me the line that, because I love my wife, <laughs> so I could use the uh, apocryphal story that Groucho Marx said in response to one of his guests who allegedly had nine kids that, you know, I like my cigar, but I take it out of my mouth now and then. <laughs> uh, yeah. But you didn't. So, yeah, so I get my, that. My, no, I, my, I understand my, that, um, particularly for Judaism, because you guys don't have a missionary program. So the only way to grow your religion over the millennia is to have more babies, you know, fecundity. There's only two ways religions grow through conversion and fecundity. So. Uh, for Jews, obviously, well, my, my, that's only my, so effective because there's, what, 15, 16 million Jews worldwide and 2 billion Christians and 1.8 billion Muslims or whatever. So, yeah. Well, my, my, my wife is, in fact, a, a, a convert. I write, I write about her in my, in, in, in my new book about our, 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 time, our time in college. Um, so uh, the, the, there are there are converts to Judaism, and and many of the finest people that I've finest Jews that I've known have have in fact been uh, been oh, converts. But you're yeah, right. Yeah, but I mean, uh, I mean that you know, that, going door to door. You guys don't have a door to door like the Jehovah Witnesses or the Mormons no, going no, on their mission. In, 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 yeah, in fact, uh, that 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 is discouraged in Judaism because right. the the. Uh, uh, the the assumption is that uh, that uh, being a Jew is a difficult thing to do, and uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, Christians are in part motivated by the the belief that uh, that only through their religion uh, can human be beings be saved. Now, as I I know on the on the margins, there's some variation in that, but Jews don't have anything resembling that doctrine. You know, so I can uh, I. I can say that I think uh, you know Judaism is the best way to God or the most direct way to God, but as a as a general matter, uh, Jews do not view Judaism as the only way to serve God, or the only path to knowledge, or the only only path to righteousness. And um, you know, be, be, because we do believe that someone can serve God as uh, as a Christian or as a Muslim uh, or, or in other ways. Uh, that that takes a lot of the pressure off to you know go out and save everyone's souls. You mean the white supremacists and anti-Semites are wrong that you're not trying to uh, replace all the non-Jews in the world and control the media and banking and take over the world like the learned elders of Zion hoax said uh, you were. <laughs> well, you, you know uh, the the traditional Jewish vision uh, is uh, of uh, of a world of uh, independent nations, each of them seeking God in its own way, but but there is a hope that ultimately all nations will uh, uh, will find and acknowledge God. So I, I think that's about as far as it goes. Hmm. Right. So this idea of that you know we're the chosen people, this is a kind of a trope used by anti Semites accusing you of saying something, you Jews, that you actually don't believe in, in the sense that you're more tolerant than. That idea would imply. Um, well, well the, the, there there is an idea of uh, 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 amskula, which means uh, uh, which is a biblical Hebrew for um, a God, uh, God's precious people, um, which sometimes sometimes gets translated as uh, as, as chosen. But I think uh, I think that you need to understand it in context. The uh, the context of this expression is um, God's covenant with the Jewish people, in which uh, the Jews are supposed to be mamlechet um, koanim uh, v'goy kadosh, a a nation of priests, um, uh, 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 no, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And uh, the, the idea of a kingdom of priests is, in fact. Um, a spiritual mission to the rest of the world. It, it, I mean, that, that's the 
that's where where Christians get the idea of of a uh, of a mission to the world, and it, it it there definitely exists such a mission in in the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament, but um, but that mission is not a it's not a proselytizing mission. It's not a it, it's not a mission of conquering or going door door to door. Uh, it's it it it's rather a uh, it. A, a mission of serving as a as a beacon, as an example or a model uh, that other nations are supposed to uh, someday be able to find f- find fitting and 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 borrow from. Um, I, I think in this context, it's it, it's crucial to notice that you know uh, Mos- M- Moses uh, speaks to to God, Creator of heaven and earth, and he uh, receives the law, and the law is supposed to teach all nations. All of that is true, but um, but Moses also receives borders from God, and uh, pro- you know, pro- probably the Jews are the first the first people ever to receive borders from their from, from their their God, who says uh, who forbids the Jews from crossing these borders and, and troubling the neighbors. The neighboring peoples each has to find its its own way to God. And the Jews are supposed to be an example. I mean, the 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 you know there are all of these you know famous uh, uh, writings of the prophets about uh, about the nations saying, "Come, let's go up to Jerusalem and uh, to to the house of uh, uh, to the house of the children of Jacob and le- learn from their ways." But nowhere is there an indication that uh, that that's supposed to be accompanied with um, you know armies. Uh, or, or even armies of of, uh, of preachers going to the other nations and trying to convert them. That that simply does not exist hmm. uh, in the Jewish uh, inheritance. Interesting. Yeah, I've been to Israel twice. I went once when I was researching my book on the Holocaust deniers. Alex Grobman, my co-author, and I went to Yad Vashem and spent quite a bit of time there. Another trip, I went to Masada. I, I walked. I got up at five in the morning and walked up to the top of Masada. It was a very moving experience. Uh, the stuff in Israel is so yeah. old. You know, I'm from California, so it's like, you know, if it's 100 years old here, that's old. You know, 100 years old in Israel would be like yesterday, right? So I get that. I've, but I've heard you say, right. you're kind of complaining a little <laughs> bit about the taxes in Israel. Over 50% of your income is, you know, taken by the government and so on. And and uh, you're you're a free market kind of guy as a conservative uh, so I guess you're there for the personal, historical, uh, religious reasons. So I, I understand that. But let's talk about um, conservatism. You were mentioning your father. I'm guessing when he was grousing about the decline of America as Rome, uh, that would be Ford Nixon time period, maybe, and then Carter after that. So pre Reagan, and then Reagan kind of writes the ship a little bit for your father. Yep. You got it. That's the, that's the time frame. Yeah. So, you know, when I think of conservatism, uh, you know, just sort of go, I was in college in the 70s. I went to Pepperdine University, which is a Church of Christ, very conservative school. Uh, President Ford came to speak there and so forth. And, you know, there I'm thinking of people like George Will, you know, uh, Irving Kristol, Charles Krauthammer, um, you know, that kind of maybe... John McCain kind of conservatives. And that, that's what I think of when I think of conserv- you know, Rush Limbaugh when he was coming on, on, online big time and you know, the Fox News guys. So you, you kind of think of that as conservatism. And I gather from reading your book, you're, you're saying that that isn't the traditional kind of conservatism. Uh, well, it, look, it's a, little, it's a little bit complicated because uh, you know, the, uh, the, these people these people that we're naming and discussing their their moving targets. Um, George Will is uh, you know in uh, in is very very much a liberal today. Um, you know, using the sort of the the, the classic meaning of the word liberal. Uh, um, uh, liberal. Seeing, seeing politics is essent- essentially about uh, uh, about individual liberties and freedoms and how to how to protect and advance them. Uh, but George was, that's not where George was in the 1980s when my friends and I at Princeton were reading his books. And in, in, in those days, he was a, uh, a full-throated uh, uh, Burkean. Today, today, today we would read, read what he was writing then and call it nationalist conservatism. 
Um, and, uh, and in fact, he, you know, he plays a very important role in, uh, in my book, in, in, in the section that deals with, with that um, conservative revival at Princeton. His statecraft as soul, soulcraft was, was not a thin liberal version of conservatism. It was, it was uh, pretty full-throated and hardcore. And uh, when we started the Princeton Tory, we took the name Tory from, you know, from his from his conservatism. And the same thing I can say about Irving Kristol, you know, today people think about neoconservatism uh, correctly, given, you know, what's what's happened over the last generation. People think of the neoconservatives as a, a, as a, you know, a group of people who are uh, out to impose uh, worldwide liberalism, like, the, you know, the new world, new world order was supposed to be. Uh, the the ultimate triumph of liberalism, you know, all around the planet. But Irving Kristol, um, who who was crucial as a mentor to us in those days. In fact, uh, he 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 funded the Princeton Tory uh, during its first years. Irving Kristol was 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 not that kind of neoconservative. Um, he 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 believed in uh, explicitly in a uh, in a conservatism based on three pillars. He said. Uh, religion, nationalism, and economic growth, where the first of the three is by far the most important. That's a that's a direct quote from Irving Kristol, and that's the kind of conservatism that we were uh, we were learning. And with regard to you know President Reagan, you can say the same thing. That it's true that uh, that he and many of his uh, 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 colleagues and supporters and associates were focused on. Uh, individual liberties and the freedom of the market, you know, as as the best tool to 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 defend America and Britain and and Europe from uh, from encroaching communism and socialism, um, and and you know that part of the agenda we supported. But people forget that Reagan too was uh, um, a a, uh, uh, a a a a close ally of people like Billy Graham and Jerry Falwell, and that. The Reagan agenda included returning prayer to the public schools. He proposed a constitutional amendment to to put prayer back in 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 the American school system, uh, and you can say the same kinds of things about his nationalism. I mean, it, it's it's uh, it's a um, historical mistake to think that 1980s conservatism is the same as uh, the uh, you know what got, what was called conservatism after. Uh, uh, George Bush began talking about uh, his new world order and 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 uh, the rule of international liberalism. I, I don't think either Reagan or Thatcher would ever have signed on to a program like that. You mean George H. W. Bush? George H. W. Mean- Bush. I mean the, the the situation the situation is it's 1989 and the Berlin Berlin Wall falls, and the victors. Um, who we called conservative in those days were actually kind of an alliance of anti-communist liberals together with conservatives. You know, in the technical jargon of American conservatism, it's uh, that kind of Buckley alliance is called fusionist conservatism. And uh, so, so that was very successful. It put Reagan and Thatcher in power. It defeated the Soviet Union. It rolled back socialism for a generation. Uh, but at the same time, it also... Um, adopted a kind of um, compromise between liberalism and conservatism, where the public face would be mostly liberal and uh, the the conservative part, uh, religion, virtues, morals, uh, transmission to future generations, the conservative part would be privatized. And, uh, you know, maybe it sounded good at the time, but, uh, but looking back on it now, we can see that what happened is the moment that Reagan and Thatcher were gone, which is by 1990, uh, the uh, religious and nationalist uh, pillars of uh, Anglo-American conservatism collapsed. I mean, they they were they were simply th- thrown away uh, by by p- leading people who took the name conservative and uh, emptied it of all, all, all connection to the, the problem of. Uh, of uh, traditionalism and uh, conservation and transmission to future generations, and that's what it looks like now. That for an entire generation, there, there, there's been no, no, no uh, conservative movement concerned with actually, actually conser- conserving and 
and transmitting ideas and institutions for a generation. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting because it shows there's a wide range of different positions one can take and still be within kind of the fuzzy set of a conceptual idea of conservatism. And I would say the same is true for liberalism uh, in the modern sense that, you know, you you go on about the uh, the kind of far left regress, what we call the regressive left uh, and their wokeness and, and all that stuff. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm on board with you. I'm critical of that, too, but I'm not a conservative. And most liberals are very also critical of that movement. Um, you know, Biden has himself said, we're not going to defund the police. We're going to refund the police. He's not on board with that woke stuff. And maybe it's just a generate. Right. Maybe it's a generational thing, you know, because he's old. But um, but so let's so but so somebody said, um, you know, OK, so I'm not a conservative. Just give me the worldview standing on one foot. <laughs> you know, what does it mean to be a conservative? What are the like the talking points, the bullet points? What would a conservative political <laughs> United States look like or not just political, but, you know, a conservative United States look like? Like I said, the 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 heart of uh, any theory of conservatism is uh, putting um, putting religious and national tradition at the center. Um, meaning that conservatism is always focused on uh, how you deal with the inheritance of previous generations and how you transmit it to to the future. And I, that's very different from uh, from liberalism. I mean, I. I, there's obviously a spectrum of opinions, but um, but uh, in principle, it's very different from liberalism. Liberalism uh, is a is a worldview that starts starts off in its classical formulation. It starts off with the um, the premise that all human beings are uh, are free and equal, um, and that uh, that they take on political obligations um, uh, largely through consent. Uh, th through consenting to have such obligations, and they see government as as a consequence as having uh, no um, no purpose other than to better guarantee the liberties and equalities that that belong to human beings by nature. That whole set of ideas is it, it's very distinctive in the history of political ideas, and it deserves a you know, label a title of its own, and and the, and the title liberalism, I think, fits it very very well because uh, because it it begins and ends, you know, places as the uh, the, the supreme principle, as Friedrich Hayek uh, once put it, uh, of 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 politics is individual liberty, and conservatives are, um, you know, cer certainly uh, recognize. Um, uh, human liberties uh, uh, as 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 being a, a a crucial and precious thing that have been handed down in the Anglo American tradition and in other traditions, and th th they're very important. But you're not going to find conservative thinkers um, saying that liberty is the supreme principle. Um, the conservative a conservative thinker is going to be somebody who will, you know, e either through the you know the 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 English common law tradition. Uh, or through uh, the, the 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 American version. Well, let's take as an example the uh, the preamble preamble to the American Constitution, which was written by you know a very conservative uh, American patriot uh, named Governor Morris, an associate of uh, George Washington and John Jay and their party. And um, that preamble speaks about seven different purposes of government, um, of which. Uh, only the last one is is the blessings of liberty. The, uh, the it includes clauses like, well, the, the the very first one is to form a more perfect union. Conservatives are very very concerned in all generations with with issues of cohesion and dissolution. The uh, uh, dissolution. The 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 question of uh, is is the people are the people loyal to one another? Are they um, do they have the capacity to uh, resist out external and internal pressures? Those are very conservative questions, and that's why they put they put uh, the more perfect union first. The, the, uh, there are also clauses uh, uh, about the pursuit of justice and the general welfare. Um, the kind of liberals that you know that we're familiar with are these uh, the, the the classical liberals that they they they're 
they their back gets up as soon as people start talking to them about uh, the purpose of government being a greater unity or the purpose of government being um, the the uh, uh, the general welfare of the public or the common good. All of these are are, are things that the conservative American founders were uh, very much aware of. And, uh, and, and today people say, no, come on, that's un-American. You know, that can't possibly, that can't possibly be right. But, but there it is in the American Constitution. So um, to a- answer your question in short, I'd say, um, I- I'd say that a, a, a conservative uh, in general is somebody who, um, who, who, who places uh, public religion um, uh, as a very, very important part of, of, of strengthening and maintaining, maintaining a nation, uh, conservatives are, um, uh, in the Anglo-American tradition, conservatives are, 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 are very often nationalists, me- meaning that they believe in a world of independent nations. Um, and the, um, the concern for um, other institution, traditional institutions, like the traditional family or the um, uh, the congregation, uh, God and Scripture. I, I, I've already mentioned all of these things are are are, are basic parts of the Anglo American uh, conservative inheritance. And uh, uh, and and today, when we you know sort of um, uh, look at an America and Britain that are are look like they're tottering on falling into uh, being controlled by the far left. Uh, d- now seems like a good time to to see if we can't rediscover some of these uh, components of the the conservative method of preserving and strengthening strengthening a nation in time. Mm. Yes, that would help explain some of my bafflement at conservative seeming hypocrisy when they say like we're in favor of small government, and then they grow the budget under every Republican administration just as much as the <laughs> Democrats do. And they, they they don't want small government. They want massive government when it comes to military and police and border control and courts and prisons and on and on. And and or when they say, well, we believe in individual liberty and autonomy and people should be free from the tyranny of the government. Oh yeah? You mean you mean like women should have the right to choose their own reproductive well not 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 women, no. How about gays? Oh, not not gays. No, no, no. What what two gay guys or two gay lesbians do in the privacy of their bedroom very much concerns us. We're very concerned about that. And and to, to me, I find that hypocritical. But maybe I have a bad, under, an incorrect understanding of conservatism. Maybe what I'm thinking of is more sort of, sort of an Ayn Randian, libertarian kind of, you know, autonomy, freedom, liberty. You do what you want to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. As long as no one gets hurt, then it's nobody's business. Right. And, and so, right. Uh, again, like at Pepperdine, everybody was reading Atlas Shrugged. Right. So, all right, I got to read Atlas Shrugged. And uh, and then so I did. And then I was kind of amazed that liberals didn't love her. I mean, here's a woman immigrant uh, whose characters right. in her novels are women who are running major corporations and they're powerful right. and strong and she's, you know, pro-choice. She's anti-racism, uh, you know, and on and on and on. And, but liberals don't like her. OK. And then conservatives, they, they kind of uncomfortably associate with her. But, you know, the atheism and the maybe too much focus on individual liberty. There was Paul Ryan walking around with co- copies of Atlas Shrugged under his armor. He handed them out to all his staff or something like that. But I think that's pretty rare. That's probably not the the conservative uh, focus. Right. Uh, right. Right. I mean, I. Look, when I again, when I when I was in college uh, a generation ago, um, nobody thought that the that uh, Ayn Rand was a conservative or that libertarians were conservatives. And and uh, I, my friends in college who uh, who were I, uh, Ayn Randians, they call themselves objectivists or um, uh, libertarians. None of them thought they were conservative. I mean, this is this is a a confusion which a generation ago didn't exist. It, it was very very clear the, the the libertarians did not believe they were conservatives. They thought the conservatives were a completely different worldview and a different party. 
and and you know I I um, I'm friendly with uh, Yaron Brook. He's the mm -hmm. yeah, you know, know like Yaron. the international yeah. chairman of the Ayn Rand Society. And uh, a few months ago, we 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 taped a kind of a friendly uh, three hour uh, conversation, a debate, and that's more or less a debate since we we disagree on a very large number of things. But it was a it it, it was a friendly conversation on Lex Friedman's uh, podcast, and. And Yaron does not think he's a conservative. He thought that he thought that I was speaking for conservatism and he was speaking for individualism and that they're two completely different things. And I, I, I think that people, you know, if people are interested in thinking clearly about the subject, um, then the, then they, they they can understand that, that these are these are are two different things. We can, um, you know, we we can be friends and we can be allies in the fight against uh, against the far left, uh, and you know the 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 advance the, the advances of uh, woke ideology, we can you know we can build a broad coalition, but uh, but it's really important for people to be able to think clearly, to be able to distinguish between a figure like Ayn Rand, who's who's pretty much a revolutionary figure. I mean, she doesn't she she certainly has no place uh, for um, uh, for religion in her worldview. And more generally, she doesn't have a place for tradition in her worldview. I mean, the, 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 there are virtually no children, no children at all in her books. Mm -hmm. um, so, so right. the, you know, the 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 aim, you know, one of the central aims of conservatives is uh, uh, is to um, establish an environment in which uh, young people can, with confidence, uh, get married and have have children, stay married, uh, raise those children to 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 uh, uh, to to be uh, health healthy and God fearing and productive, and um, you know none of those things interest her. They don't interest her at all. So you know if you can't tell the difference between you know between uh, that and conservatism, then then uh, I don't know. I think you need need a little to think about it a little Just bit more. Just need to read your book because that's a, a nice summary of that. So you characterize Enlightenment liberalism's political paradigm as follows. In four points, all men are perfectly free and equal by nature. Two, political obligation arises from the consent of the free individual. Three, government exists due to the consent of a large number of individuals, and its only legitimate purpose is to enable these individuals to make use of the freedoms that is theirs by nature. And four, these premises are universally valid truths, which every individual can derive on his own if he only chooses to do so by reasoning about those matters. Yeah, I say right on. I like that. I'm an Enlightenment uh, liberal, I guess, in that sense, or classical liberal or, or uh, Enlightenment humanist, because I'm an atheist, but I believe in moral principles and so forth and um, and, and so on. So, you know, what's wrong with those? Now, let's, let's just take examples like religion in public schools. Now, here we're only talking about public schools. You know, if you want to send your kids to a private um, a Christian school or Jewish school or Muslim school, whatever, that's fine. Um, so pr public schools. So we have to service all 100 million youth or however many it is in America now. Right. And so you want to emphasize and you liked Reagan's idea. Let's bring prayer back in school. Well, would you endorse, say, uh, all American school children say something like, you know, Allah, uh, you know, Allah is God and Muhammad is his prophet <laughs> every day? Because I I looked it up, well, there are, there are six let's see three point five million Muslims in the United States. They're American citizens. They're protected by the Constitution. Yeah. They have a right to practice their religion yeah. without interference. And you know the the idea that you want to interject, I'm assuming Judeo Christianity into public schools at the exclusion of these Muslim citizens protected by the Constitution. That seems well immoral. Well, you know. Uh, you're, you're asking me a good question, but it, but it, it's a little funny. I mean, I, there isn't there's no such thing as Judeo Christianity. I, I, I mean, you know, may, maybe with within within Christianity, it's true that there are certain movements that are, um, you know, that are much more uh, tied to the Old Testament than others, and so you know, you could say that those kinds of Christians are Judeo Christians or something like that. But um, Ju Judaism and Christianity are uh, are, are are not the same religion. There are very very profound differences between them, and um, the the uh, 
um, the kind of thing provision, the kind of provisions and carve outs uh, that I would want to see for um, for you know uh, Muslims or Hindus uh, apply just as well to Jews. I mean, you, it's, it, you're not you're not going to have um, uh, observant Jewish children going to school and and saying Christian prayers. They're not going to do it. Uh, but uh, the 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 issue that I'm trying to tackle in this book is um, I, I I you know you 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 may not agree with this, but I, I I think that it's becoming clear by now to me and to many of many people I talk to that um, that when the U.S. Supreme Court beginning in 1947 and then kind of reaching uh, like a crescendo in the 1960s. Um, banned religion from the public school system in the United States, uh, declared separation of church and state to be a uh, constitutional doctrine um, uh, that, that, that needed to be imposed on, on, on all of the states in the United States. When that happened, you know, people, people don't you know, remember this, the, 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 the circumstance. There's kind of like this, this myth that the Supreme Court was, was objecting to uh, to, to schools that were forcing Christianity on 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 uh, on, on people, and the the actual case uh, in McCullough in 1948, in which the Supreme Court first applied um, separation of church and state uh, to the schools in America, the case that they were talking about was Chicago schools that had a um, a, a, a a program that allowed students to choose. Uh, religious instruction from uh, from a Catholic instructor or from a Protestant instructor or from a Jewish instructor. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm sure that 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 uh, that that if, it, you know, if we if anyone tried to implement something like that today, then the, the, there would be a Hindu option, there'd be a Muslim option, you know, wherever, wherever that's possible. And uh, my view is that 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 kind of um, uh, ecumenical, uh, fair-minded attempt to to make uh, the Bible and a connection to God available to American students is something that should uh, should take place in those places where there's a majority in favor of it. I mean, obviously, mm. if people in Massachusetts uh, don't want something like that, then I don't know anybody who would try to force it on them. But that's not the situation in America. The situation is that that states where there there is or easily could be a uh, a majority for uh, Bible instruction uh, in, and an acknowledgement of God in the school system, uh, the, the, those states are not permitted to do that. And mm -hmm. that's what I think needs to be rethought. America's federalist system uh, could be a very very good answer to mm, uh, to I how see. to deal with the you know, the many different kinds of people that America, you know, societies that America currently has. Yeah. So you mean like, like the Roe decision being overturned, if it does, just turn it back to the states. Well, the problem, Yaram, is that in the phrase you use, the dominant, um, you know, religion or whatever. Well, what if in a century from now, Islam is the dominant religion in America? It doesn't seem likely, but it could happen. It looks like it's happening in Europe. It could happen here. You still want on the books the kind of legal precedent that the dominant religion gets to teach its uh, principles to public school children? Like the exclusion is very I, likely I, I, of I Judaism. I, I, well, you know, let let me ask you back. I mean, take, turn that question around and have you answer. Do you think there's any chance that if there is a Muslim majority anywhere in uh, in America and Europe, a hundred years from now, that 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 they're not going to be teaching Islam as, as the gen, as a general yes, part of, it, of the education it, it, of all yes, young I, people in the school as system. As long as we keep that of course wall they up would. between, uh, be, uh, as long as we keep that wall up between church and state, that's not going to happen, right? Because well, look, that's the yeah, purpose of let, it. Let, that's let, the let, reason let, we have that is for this very reason. So that can't happen. That's why I don't want you to chip away at but, that wall. That you keep that wall up, build that wall, sir. Big, beautiful wall. But but but, <laughs> but 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 you know that Muslims are not going to have such a wall, right? And I'm not 
I'm not in the slightest saying this to disparage them. I mean, that may sound to you like, you know, criticism, but I, I, I'm saying that it, it on the on this point, Muslims know what they're doing. They don't they they, they don't tolerate conditions under which um, uh, Muslim communities with Muslim children are are unable to teach Islam to their kids. And I I think I think that Christians and Jews should 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 uh, be um, extremely concerned that their kids do not go to school in an environment that is um, uh, increasingly, it teaches religion, but it's the woke religion it teaches. Well, I, you know, I'm not a big fan of woke religion either. Uh, but again, just keep all of that out of public school. So uh, I know Jews don't do this, but certainly kind of the moral majority type of evangelical Christianity, they would love to have the opportunity to promote their doctrines to public school children if they could get away with it, but they can't because it's against the law. And it's a good thing we have those laws because that would be unconstitutional and, in my opinion, immoral. Right now, again, we're just talking about the way it's presented. I have no problems with teaching like a comparative world religions course. I think every student should take that, maybe age appropriate, middle school, high school, something like that. You know, comparative mythology, you know, just do all of them. Right. And, and then they could see for themselves, well, each of them claims to be the one true religion or they have the one correct uh, set of doctrines. And, you know, how can we tell? Then 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 you could employ some epistemology. Well, yeah, let's think about that. How do you decide which is the one true religion? And because each of them makes exclusive uh, and contradictory claims about truth. How can we get to the truth? If you're an anthropologist from Mars and you come to visit and you talk to you and a, and a Christian uh, theologian and, a, and, and, and so forth across the board, and they each make certain truth claims, and the anthropologist from Mars says, well, how can I tell which is the correct one? Is there some experiment we can run? Is there some uh, set of arguments that we can reason through to, 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 to tell? And as far as I can tell, the answer is no, there isn't. This is the problem with religion yeah. and why it's different from science, that there is no epistemological system to get at the truth. Well, I think I, 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 I think that you are um, that you're uh, ascribing to religion in general uh, characteristics that exist uh, in certain kinds of Christianity with which you're familiar. Um, that there, you, you, you can't you can't from 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 a traditional Orthodox Jewish perspective. You can't make claims about uh, the one true religion. You know, the, 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 there are such claims in the New Testament about New Testament religion, but you can't find anything like that in, 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 in the Hebrew Bible or in the rabbinic literature. Um, different nations have different traditions. These different traditions are, are, are different perspectives on, uh, on how you get to God. And, the, um, and, and I think you're right that it's extremely difficult for an individual thinking about knowledge as a uh, uh, thinking about epistemology, theory of knowledge as something that refers only to the individual search for truth. I think it's very, very difficult to to figure out how you would um, uh, decide among you know, among competing religions. Um, but that that's again that that kind of theory of knowledge, an individualistic theory of knowledge, is not a conservative theory of knowledge. Conservatives. In general, think that um, that uh, and and by the way, Friedrich Hayek. What, what I'm about to say about conservatives is also true of Hayek and and other liberals who are uh, aware of the role that traditions play in in uh, constructing and holding together societies. From from this kind of traditionalist perspective, um, the uh, the enterprise of seeking knowledge is uh, is a collective enterprise. And uh, each each family, tribe, and, and and nation has different traditions that it it inherits, and over generations, those um, uh, those traditions run into uh, bumps and problems and are uh, repaired by internal uh, deliberation among the people who are who are loyal loyal to the tradition. And um, you know, what's fascinating is that that when you uh, when you look at English common law, 
I mean, it, it sounds like what, what what we're talking about is 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 just religion, but uh, but the English common law tradition is very very much as as almost the exact same epistemology about the law that I was just describing to Judaism, which is that it uh, it assumes that there are that there is such a thing as as you know the best legal system, the 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 the, the true true practices of law and morals. Uh, that would be best. It assumes that there is such a thing, uh, but the common lawyers also are aware that uh, every nation has different experiences, and every, every person has different experiences, and that agreement among uh, about these kinds of very very difficult questions is it, it it it's hard to come to. Argument doesn't doesn't resolve these problems most of the time, and what that what the common lawyers propose is um, take what works and uh, repair it. Where you know where you see it breaking down, where you where where you see injustice, where you see dysfunction, uh, then you uh, then you you make repairs. And over you know centuries and millennia, uh, they they believe that the thing improves. I I I I I, I think that um, you know I I I I, uh, I told you that I grew up in a physicist's house and um, mm-hmm. yeah um, and and. You know that that gave me um, uh, not not only my father's uh, uh, views about the pursuit of truth, which are very very similar to yours, and and you know and I've inherited and em- embraced them to a certain extent and modified them a little bit, um, but uh, the um, um, the the his- the the history of common law. It looks quite a bit like the history of science, if you um, if you look at it, if you th- or if you're willing to consider it as a collective enterprise, um, then it uh, uh, it does go through um, you know long periods of uh, sort of orthodoxy where everybody thinks that things are you know are they've basically got it right, and then it hits bumps. And uh, and and the bumps start annoying people, and they they want to come up with a better way of understanding things. Uh, it, it it might be that there is some way that this can end up being kind of like a a, a a general theory of human knowledge that you know has a very very important place for the individual, but the individual is always within some kind of a a much larger collective enterprise. Yeah, I, I agree. I think uh, the constitution of knowledge is what Jonathan Rausch calls this in his new book, which I highly recommend, where he shows the similarities between science, the law, and other institutions, journalism, for example, where you got to have fact checkers, you got to have debate, disputation, you got to have some corrective feedback mechanism to correct the errors that have been made, and you accumulate knowledge, you you build. This is a, very much your conservative traditional argument that you know, let's not just burn down the whole system. We've learned a lot over the centuries. Let's take what we've learned and that worked and apply that in kind of a pragmatic way. Here, I, I'm, I've been playing with some ideas about different kinds of truths. I think my next book may be called The Architecture of Truth, where I distinguish between empirical truths like physicists or, or whatever, and religious truths, amongst others. So, for example, the resurrection. Did the resurrection actually happen? Well, as you know, Christians say, if it didn't happen, then there's no point in being a Christian, right? It, it, it very much turns on that. And I've debated a number of theologians who, who claim they have evidence and arguments. And, and, and I've heard them. They debate, here's the six reasons why you sh- that I believe right. in the resurrection, and you <laughs> should too, right? And, uh, you know, the, the missing tomb and the women that were at the tomb the, and the people that saw him, you know, post, post-death, um, apparitions there he was three days later how is this possible you know and on and on and 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 yet so here's my quick counter and i'll ask you you know why don't if the evidence is so good and the arguments are so sharp why don't jews accept jesus as the messiah you know you can't just say well if they understood the arguments you know they'd become christians no they understand the arguments you can't tell me these learned rabbis don't get your arguments they understand the arguments they just don't Okay, so I, then I tried kind of a Jordan Peterson, uh, Joseph Campbell kind of mythic truth. Maybe it's sort of a mythically true, you know, to bur- you know bear the burden of your own cross, you know, and, and be born again in your own life and so on. 
And but the theolog Christian uh, evangelicals and theologians I talk, they're not buying that. No, no, no. We don't mean mythically true, right. psychologically <laughs> true. You know, the Jordan Peterson true. No, we mean it actually happened, right? So, why if that if that was true, why are Jews not Christians, and why aren't you a Christian? Well, look, I, I, I again, um, w w w <laughs> with love and respect to my uh, to my. Uh, 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 Christian friends and colleagues, um, the New Testament, again, provides a very particular kind of religion. And the demand, that, that demand, the, the point that goes, um, if the resurrection didn't happen, then there's no point to our whole religion. That's explicit in the New Testament. That's not, you know, something C.S. Lewis made up. That's, that's just part of the way that uh, that uh, the New Testament ap approaches questions of uh, truth and and reality. I, I have a I, I wrote a book called uh, the Philosophy of Hebrew Scripture, uh, in, in which I make this comparison between uh, the the New Test Testament's um, the kind of knowledge that the New Testament is demanding, which is it's very very much um, uh, uh, analogous to to you know a court of law where. Uh, evidence is mustered to try to establish facts, and uh, that that again we don't we just don't have that in uh, in the uh, in the Hebrew Bible or in the subsequent rabbinic tradition. That kind of standard doesn't exist. And um, uh, more generally, I have a chapter in that book about uh, uh, about the way that the the, the word emet, which means uh, uh, truth, is used in uh in the bible and i i mean in the in in the old testament the jewish bible and um for for jews the um the the, the human mind works with uh, uh stories it tells stories it uses metaphors in order to be able to describe truths that are very very difficult to uh, uh to get at using um uh uh, using scientific language, and those um, that assemblage of um, you know, it's it's interesting that you uh, that you called it mythic. I, I, I'm you know, people use the word mythic in all sorts of different ways, and I'm especially you know when academics use it, sometimes it sounds like uh, they really mean that a myth is something that maybe happened, maybe didn't happen, but then later it turns out that the word myth is only being applied to things that they're sure didn't happen. So I, I want to be careful with, with the term. But, um, but if you look at um, debate within Orthodox Judaism uh, over thousands of years on these questions, uh, you'll find that, uh, that in our tradition, the argument the cer that, that, um, that certain parts of Scripture or many parts of Scripture is, um, uh, are, are intended uh, metaphorically and are not intended to be realistic or they're intended uh, 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 didactically, um, these things, they, they fit within a general framework that regards traditions as um, uh, tr in inherited tradition as being reliable. And, but then you, you ask, you know, what does reliable mean? Does re reliable mean that you can prove it like you can, you know, in, like in a court? No, what reliable means is that it's uh, that it 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 can be relied upon to uh, to uh, fulfill God's promises. God's promises are uh, uh, that that the that the righteous will be uh, uh, rewarded in this life. By the way, not uh, not not only in the next life, um, in uh, that that evil will be punished. That uh, um, that those who keep God's covenant uh, will flourish. That those who uh, depart from God's covenant will uh, 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 will not. Um, those kinds of um, broad tests for is the Torah in general reliable? Those undergird in the the life of a uh, of a religious Jew who, generally speaking, thinks that the, our inherited traditions are true. But if somebody comes along and says, um, "Listen, I just 
I, 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 you know, I just, I, uh, uh, read Maimonides or Bravanel, and he says that this or that part is, uh, is metaphorical. Nobody gets, nobody gets exercised about this. This is an integral part of trying to understand what the Torah means. And, um, you know, so I, I, I I think, I think, I think my, Christian friends just, um, they might have an easier time of it if they were willing to uh, go a little bit more Jordan Peterson, but it's kind of none of my business, you know, like Christianity <laughs> has been very successful at doing what it does. And, uh, you know, if they say, look, your arm, we don't need advice from you, <laughs> then, uh, you know, I'm not going to argue with that. Yeah, you seem to also be making something of a pragmatic truth argument. That is what works. Yes. Regardless of whether it's empirically yes. true or not is a separate issue. Um, if it's a kind of truth that brings people together, reduces violence and increases harmony and, and enmity between peoples and tribes, then it then that's a good thing. And but but I would argue that, in fact, that is a kind of em, empiricism. It, it, you talk about, you know, the, the historical tradition of seeing what worked in the past. That's a kind of empiricism. Uh, that the law has used uh, over the centuries. Like, well, you know, we used to try this. We used to try uh, burning women at the stake for cavorting with, with demons in the middle of the night. Well, that, that was probably a bad idea, right? Torture doesn't really work to get uh, useful in- information. Really, people will say anything to stop the pain. So maybe, maybe let's not do that anymore. And then, you know, Blackstone's ratio of 10 to 1, you know, better one, uh, 10 guilty people go free than that one innocent person be convicted. And, you know, yeah, that's a pretty good ratio. And we've kind of developed that. And to me, it's a good argument against the death penalty because our system is deeply flawed still in terms of uh, how convictions are made and, and police corruption and all that. But, um, but, but I can see that building then an argument for why it's good to have a nation that's grounded in some sort of religious principles. But can't you get that from, let's call them secular moral principles also that works. That is, regardless of what your particular religious beliefs are, in America, this is we have the Constitution and here's our laws. And 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 these are the laws. If you don't like it, go live somewhere else. And those laws are more universal in that kind of enlightenment liberalism sense that you're critiquing that in fact I would argue is the best thing that ever happened for most religions. You know, if you look at the when I was writing my Holocaust denial book, I looked in the history of anti-Semitism, you know, it's, as you well know, it's a dark, dark uh, period in human history. It's, uh, and I should point out that, you know, before Christians and Christianity became enlightened and liberal after the Enlightenment, you know, they were the ones, just just look at Martin Luther, that, that were only too glad to herd Jews into barns and burn them alive, because they, you know, you were Christ killers, you killed our Lord. Right, which is to me the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Because if it's God's plan, then you should thank the Jews for helping carry it out. Because that's what had to happen anyway. Ranting now, but but so I would argue that in fact, modern Christians, if you you know you read much of the Bible, there's a lot of pretty nasty stuff in there. But you know that they, they they don't want to stone to death any gays. They're not like that anymore. They're tolerant. Why are they tolerant? Because they went through the Enlightenment with everybody else, whereas before the Enlightenment. Your people would have been in big trouble because of the the anti-Semitism baked into the Christian religion. I I attribute that in my book, The Moral Arc, to reason and science and enlightenment, humanism, and that kind of expanding the moral sphere to include all people, regardless of their race or creed or religion. And I'm glad to hear you say right. that you know Judaism is way more tolerant than than I think most people realize. That's good. But you know, lucky you. <laughs> You know, had you been born a Christian six hundred years ago, you you wouldn't have you wouldn't have been tolerant of Jews, right? Um, you know, you know. Let, let me just for a second go go back to the 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 point about you were making, which I which I agree with about uh, um, uh, historical empiricism, uh, and it, it, uh, I write about this in my book also. I, I, historical empiricism is the term I use to describe. Uh, the uh, the way that the common lawyers approached truth, which uh, I see as you know a is, a as a pillar of 
Anglo-American conservatism, that, that, that tradition has, does in fact have an, uh, an empiricist uh, view of truth. And in, and, and in fact, you can, you can argue, it's been argued that, that, the, um, uh, that the adoption of this kind of uh, evolutionary empiricist thinking uh, from the common lawyers by the scientists, um, ha ha there's a kind of historical causal relationship between uh, legal empiricism in Britain and and uh, the 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 rise of British science. But let me just go for a second to um, back to the Bible just for a second. Um, the, in 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 Deuteronomy, there's there's this crucial passage. Um, which is attributed to Moses. Moses is is uh, is speaking and sort of kind of summing up summing up the law before the uh, the Israelites go into Canaan, and um, and he asks the question, um, you know, I, I how will you know whether uh, a prophet has been sent by God? And the answer that he gives is if the things that the prophet says come, come true, then you know that he's been sent by God. And if they don't come true, then you're not allowed to believe what he says. And that, that is a, um, is, uh, I, I, I argue in my book on the Bible, that, that is in fact a, uh, a pragmatist test of truth. It's not, it's not this kind of um, Aristotelian, you know, piercing into reality and being able to find the eternal essences, you know, that exist there. It's, uh, it, it very much is about uh, testing, testing words and ideas against unfolding reality over time. And uh, the, 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 um, the English empiricist tradition, I, 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 I have a guess, I can't prove it, but I have a guess that, uh, that it, it in part arises from the encounter with this this kind of thinking in uh, in the Old Testament, right? So uh, again, I think we can make empirical arguments for real moral values that exist out there, and by out there I mean outside of you and I as individuals, part of human nature, human culture. So uh, let me just see how far you'll go with me on this. Um, so here's here's what okay. I write in in the moral arc, you know, would you rather survive and flourish or suffer and die an early death? An answer for this general question follows from your preferences to these specific choices. Would you rather be satiated or starving, quenched or thirsty, healthy or disease-ridden, free from pain or racked in chronic ag agony, face fairness and justice or cruel and unusual punishment, free from chains or yoked in chattel slavery, prospering in a democracy or struggling in an autocracy? working in a capitalist or communist economy, enjoy civil liberties or be refrained from volitional actions, express yourself freely or be censored on what to say and think, be knowledgeable or ignorant, employ reason or irrationality. In short, would you rather live in North Korea or South Korea, East Germany or West Germany during the Cold War? Right? So this kind of, empiric <laughs> this, this kind of empiricism applies across the board now and historically, right? So people yeah. vote with their feet. Uh, they vote with their dollars. I think we can infer based on human nature that the answer to, the answer is to all those questions, you know, short of somebody who's suicidal because they're so depressed or they, you know, they are into masochism or whatever. You know, most people, most of the time would prefer the you know, the better life. And we know that there are certain conditions politically and economically that are better. Right. Just East Germany versus West Germany. Is that example, North and South Korea is even more dramatic. So there you see, I say that we're actually discovering something about human nature. In the same way that I think Hobbes and, and, and the other Enlightenment thinkers at least thought they were trying to do, like, you know, Hume and so on. Let's, let's look at what people are actually like and see what we can discern from them. Now, they didn't know much about tribal societies, if, if anything, but at least they're trying to reason their way to it, right? And, you know, so uh, here is my hypothesis, that the same way that Galileo and Newton discovered physical laws and principles about the natural world that are really out there, so too have social scientists discovered moral laws and principles about human nature and society that really do exist. Just as it was inevitable that the astronomer Johannes Kepler would discover that planets have elliptical orbits, given that he was making accurate astronomical measurements, and given that planets really do travel in elliptical orbits, he could hardly have discovered anything else. Scientists studying political, economic, social, and moral subjects will discover certain things that are true in these fields of inquiry. 
for example, that democracies are better than autocracies, market economies are better than command economies, that torture and the death penalty do not curb crime, that burning women as witches is a fallacious idea, that women are too, not too weak and emotional to run companies or countries, and most poignantly here, that blacks do not like being enslaved and that Jews do not want to be exterminated. Why? Because it's on our nature, right? So we're discovering moral truths that are actually out there. And uh, so to give, to, to throw one to you, you know, I think religions have kind of figured out much of this over the millennia by trial and error. And that what you're arguing is that right. we've kind of kept the good parts of the religion. But I'm saying, well, but we can also derive it through empirical uh, empiricism and reason about what works based on what people want. Look, I, I, I like the approach, and I, I mean, I think, I think that um, uh, that if you um, if if you take a look on my writing, at my and my writings about the Bible and Judaism, I think that you'll find that that your approach and mine that there's a there's a kinship between them. Um, the, the 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 there's a the, there's a very basic similarity. Um, that I I think that the place where I you know where I I can't tell whether we agree or not is that um, is that you're testing at at the level of uh, of uh, it, the individual what's what's yeah. good for the individual yeah. would the individual right. like to to do this or that but, which is fine it's legitimate I don't think there's anything anything wrong with it but I uh, I I I find that um, that this this conversation isn't necessarily aware of the fact that. Uh, that the good of individuals um, depends on, we could call them em emergent properties that appear only at the level of societies. Uh, you know, so the, the the kinds of things that we're that that I'm thinking of are things like, um, it, is this society capable of uh, of uh, maintaining its internal peace and justice by winning wars? Is it capable of winning wars? Is it uh, is it capable of uh, being sufficiently cohesive so that it doesn't disintegrate into into internal civil war and and destruction is it capable of transmitting the things that have been uh, learned about empirically the things that have been learned by trial and error uh, about what is good for people is it capable of transmitting those things from one generation to the next because that that act of transmission is very difficult you know regardless of how true what it is that you're talking about is and so, you know, I, I think that if you would allow that kind of repair, I, I, I don't think it's a minor repair. I think, I, I think that if you ask the same questions at the level of emergent properties of entire societies and nations, um, then, the, uh, then the answers will come out a little bit different. I mean, you know, obviously, you know, you'll still get people... You, Get individuals, you know, prefer, preferring to be free rather than being enslaved—that's for sure. But, um, but will people, uh, people's preferences, track um, what's actually empirically necessary for the uh, uh, the, the st stability and preservation of one of these good societies over generations? That that's not so certain, and uh, the and, and and for that reason, I you know I I, I press this point about the uh, the the multiple different goods that um, that need to be balanced in you know by by just and uh, and wise government, because if you're not paying attention to questions like you know I mean you you. you 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 you, uh, you 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 mentioned the you know the the utterly reckless endless you know growth of uh, 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 overspending of the American budget I and mean, this is this has been going on basically since the 1960s, um, which is roughly plus or minus when the um, the rule of thumb that uh, that budgets should be balanced kind of just disappeared from you know from <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, America. Political economy and its moral economy, and uh, look, you look at the, at the kind of spending that that you know that all American governments now do, uh, just inconceivably larger than, uh, than than the funds that they can raise. 
um, this kind of thing is not, um, it's not, um, the, the, the empirical test for this kind of thing is at the level of entire nations. And it's very difficult by looking at individuals to, to draw conclusions about it. And I, I would hope you'd include that in, in, in your empiricism. Yeah, so I, I'm, I follow you with the importance of the family. So individuals are part of a family, and families are part of communities. That we know has been true for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years of primate evolution and then hominid evolution. The nation state is pretty new, just a few centuries old as a concept. The city state is thousands of years old as a political unit. And, you know, before 1500, there were, I don't know, like 500 different political units in Europe. You know, then it boiled down to less than 50 by the mid 20th century. So, and that's kind of where we're stuck. I, I, and and I, I, I kind of project at the end of the moral arc of what I could imagine things could be in 500 years, a thousand years from now, you know, maybe we'll go back to city states or whatever. The, my concern about nationalism and the nation state is that they're capable of massive destruction, right? Huge wars and a, a little bit too much control over individual uh, fam freedoms and also, I guess, families. Uh, you know, that worries me. Uh, the board, you know, economically, I'm, I'm pretty, again, I take the free trade stuff pretty seriously. You know, just open the borders and, 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 and let people trade with one another. What do I care if they're Mexican or Chinese or whatever? And, you know, Reagan famously bailed out the uh, Harley Davidson motorcycle company in the 70s as kind of a almost a mercantilist, you know, uh, you know, we got to protect American jobs. And I remember at the time I was shopping around right. for a motorcycle and I bought a, a Honda, a Honda 125. And I love that bike. But the prices went up. So how does that help me? Because he put tariffs on Japanese motorcycles. That doesn't help me. I'm an American citizen. He's protecting the producers, not the consumers, right? So economic nationalism, to me, is more focused on producing production companies, the jobs, rather than the hundreds of millions of consumers that are, that are going to be harmed. It seems to me that, again, that maybe that's my individual perspective that that kind of economic nationalism is not good. You, you know, let, let, let me approach this from, from, uh, from a, slightly, a slightly different angle. Um, I don't believe that we're going back to city-states. And the reason I don't believe we're going back to city-states is that already in the time of, uh, you know, the, the, in, in, in antiquity, um, imperial states proved that they would overwhelm anything that resembles a city-state uh, consistently and constantly. And the, the emergence of the, the nation-state, here my, my historiography is not, uh, you know, the, 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 the claim that uh, the nation-state is, uh, is, is modern is uh, familiar from, you know, academic nationalism studies. Um, but the, the, there, there is uh, there's a dissenting school of thought on the subject. Probably the best, uh, the, the the best book on the antiquity of of nations. There's been a whole bunch of them, but probably the best one at this point is uh, Pro Professor Azar Gat wrote a book on on the antiquity of nations uh, called just Nations from Tel Aviv. You, you've seen it, and um, I, I think that the that uh, if I could sort of you know provide an interpretive gloss on, on this. Um, ancient Israel and ancient Armenia and, uh, and, and various other countries uh, were nation states already, you know, 2000, you know, 2000 or 2300 years ago. And, um, and that model has uh, spread as the, the main competitor to, uh, to the imperial state uh, because of the fact, I think, that uh, that 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 the nation state combines the um, uh, the the large scale the, the capacity for large scale economies uh, and and therefore the the capacity to to field relatively large armies it combine what you find in empires the nation state combines that with the cohesion of a uh, of a people that feels that it's fighting for its own independence and self-rule and its own traditions, rather than you know all those nations who are trudging around fighting for an empire 
that, that conquered them, and they don't have any choice. Uh, and uh, both the, both the Israelite and the Armenian cases were, kind of, were were probably shocking in in the ancient Greek world because because it proved that an independent nation can defeat imperial armies because of this kind of uh, cohesion. Um, so there's a I think, and this is this is basically what my what my my earlier book, my book on nationalism, is about. It is my 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 hypothesis, my proposal, is that. Um, that the nation state keeps reappearing all through history because it's a um, it it's large enough to be able, at least in some circumstances and in some combinations, to take on uh, the aggression of imperial states. On the one hand, <clears throat> and on the other, it um, it still maintains the some of the uh, the particularity, the homishness, the uh, the the feeling that you're fighting for your brothers, you know, for your family, um, which which existed in the city states and the tribes. Um, anyway, that I continue to see that sentiment among you know among nationalists today. I mean, if you if you uh, scratch the surface of of uh, Brexit in in Britain, that's what you find. You find this feeling of. Um, Look, if we want to make mis- we'll make mistakes, but we want to make our own mistakes. We don't want somebody else to be d- making the mistakes for us and imposing it on us. So there's a there is a kind of um, a love of freedom, which is not only individual freedom, but it but it's it it's national freedom that's very real to people. And as as long as it's real, I think there's going to be nation state. Yeah, you're probably right. I think that's probably right. Uh, I guess. It would be good to come back in 500 years after we're cryonically frozen to see. How right, it we'll, out. we'll come back together in 500 years and, and see whether, whether this let was me, true or not. Let me read to you another passage here from Steve Pinker, who's a fellow Enlightenment humanist. Uh, so he's talking about um, moral values as kind of platonic truths. On this analogy, he says, we are born with a rudimentary concept of number, but as soon as we build on it with formal mathematical reasoning, the nature of mathematical reality forces us to discover some truths and not others. No one who understands the concept of two, the concept of four, and the concept of addition can come to any conclusion but that two plus two equals four. Perhaps we're born with a rudimentary moral sense, and as soon as we build on it with moral reasoning, the nature of moral reality focuses, forces us to some conclusions but not others. And then he continues, if I appeal to you to do anything that affects me, to get off my foot or tell me the time or not run me over with your car, then I can't do it in a way that privileges my interests over yours, say retaining my right to run you over with my car if I want you to take me seriously. Unless I'm a galactic overlord, I have to state my case in a way that would force me to treat you in kind. I can't act as if my interests are special just because I'm me and you're not, any more than I can persuade you that the spot I'm standing on is a special place in the universe just because I happen to be standing on it. And then he concludes from this, this is what he calls the principle of interchangeable perspectives that's embodied in the golden rule discovered by many religions over thousands of years and, then the point of this, rediscovered in various forms like Spinoza's Viewpoint from Eternity, The Social Contract of Thomas Hobbes, Jean-Jacques Rousseau and John Locke, Immanuel Kant's Categorical Imperative, and John Rawls's Veil of Ignorance. So is that not the discovery of a universal moral truth that applies to everybody or could apply to everybody, uh, which is different from what you're arguing in a kind of a religious based nationalism. Well, I, I, I agree with Steve that there, uh, that there are um, uh, universally applicable moral and political truths that they need to be discovered. Um, I, I, I don't believe that Steve is actually an, an empiricist an empiricist on this subject. I mean, uh, you know, he he he, uh, he 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 and I have talked about about this this subject at at, at some length, and uh, well, I, I wasn't think aware that, of that interesting uh, that he is. I think he's hesitant to look the the, the framework that he's using. He 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 has a framework, uh, uh, an Enlightenment framework, which assumes that um, that science science like trial and error uh, began very recently, 
um, that it, it you know it it appears in 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 the human race for the first time sometime in the 1700s or you know maybe a few years earlier with Newton or something like that and uh, and he's unwilling to look at the thousands of years that preceded the Enlightenment as having contributed much of anything uh, to uh, to the the good societies that we live in so um, you know so it, it, it's a little it's a it's a little bit diffi- difficult to resolve this kind of disagreement because you know in Newton's day um, uh, you know both Newton and probably all of his colleagues uh, would have agreed that the the great discovery in um, in you know in, in terms of universal system of morals was the Ten Commandments and the one God and the uh, you know, I, I I don't think there's any chance of getting Steve to uh, to a, agree with that. But if you, uh, I, I think if you take seriously this process of trial and error, I think that I think that you would see that um, the discovery of the one God, which gives us for the first time the idea of a universal uh, universal truth, not a local truth, and uh, uh, the, the 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 Ten Commandments, the uh, the, the the discovery of the idea that all men are created in God's image. You can name various other things. The, these are the, uh, uh, the 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 pillars on which um, Jewish and Christian society and later liberal society uh, built its um, uh, build their theories, and they are successful because of the fact that they've inherited something that has been successful for thousands of years. The problem with uh, w- with with Steve is that. It, because he's not willing to um, to test, you know, like many other fans of enlightenment, he's not willing to consider those thousands of years of of social evolution and trial and error as having contributed anything. And as a consequence, he's willing to um, uh, lightly discard many things that you know that I think are the most important things, keeping society steady and holding it together. Uh, you know, for just just as uh, as uh, as an obvious example the the uh, the idea of the traditional family um as uh as the cornerstone and the building block of of society both economically educationally uh, spiritually uh, that's not something that we find in pinker and uh it's kind of surprising that he thinks that it's so obvious that we could just do without it well, there you're talking, I think, about an internal governor that is in citizens' minds. These are the kind of right ways to behave. And, you know, a lot of the founding fathers agreed that, you know, if we, we're not going to have a big federal government. So um, hopefully the people that are out there on the frontiers, you know, they have an internal governor until the, the long arm of the law could get out there. Right. So uh, I, I could see that. But I think Steve's point is that, well, but now... You know, if we can universalize these ideas like a universal human rights kind of a, a statement uh, that more and more people agree to, that that has been happening. So, for example, to rip an example from the headlines, you know, Putin is something of a nationalist, a conservative ethno-nationalist anyway, who wants to make Russia no, great no, again. No, come on. And the reason the world hates come on, him. That's not fair. <laughs> that, that's not fair. That, wait, wait, that's not fair. Do you think Putin thinks he's a nationalist? Or is that something you're ascribing well, to him? Well, I'm getting that because more I from that seen, Alexander Dugan. I, you know, you know Alexander Dugan, uh, Putin's well, I, Rasputin. Neither, he's called. neither Dugan. Dugan is not a nationalist either. Uh, Dugan is mm, a Eurasianist. What is he? he is an imperialist. He wants oh, all yes, of yes, Eurasia yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, under. No, no, no. This is look. This is this is important. We shouldn't get carried away. Uh, if Putin were arguing for, you know, the the uh, the importance of the Russian nation state, then, you know, I, I'm 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 certainly willing to agree with you that there are plenty of nationalists who are, you know, who are who are, who are nasty and criminal and odious. That I mean, I I have no problem with that. But but Putin in particular, I haven't heard a nationalist word out of him for many many years. His his, as far as I can tell. He only uses the word nationalist to describe the Ukrainians, and he uses it as a as a pejorative. He he knows he's ruling a a, a multi multinational empire. That the, the the Russians are one of 
one of a whole bunch of nations in in the Russian Empire that he now rules and that he wants to build. And he can't go with the rhetoric of nationalism, which would immediately imply that he, you know, that he, he has no claim on, you know, on Poland or, or, or on, on, uh, um, or, or on Finland. And he's, that's not his direction at all. Yeah, that's a good point. I think that's a fair point. Um, okay, let's, let's go to the Ten Commandments and, and maybe you could walk me through, um, why let's take slavery as an example. As we know, it's been practiced throughout history by all peoples. It was a massive Arab slave trade that went in the other direction as the Atlantic slave trade went and probably enslaved just as many people, if not more. Uh, but why is there nothing in the Old Testament New Commandments like thou shalt not enslave thy fellow humans? Instead, we get you know Leviticus 25, 44, you may purchase a male or female slaves from among the foreigners who live among you. Or Leviticus, you may also purchase the children of such resident foreigners. And then my uh, my favorite, uh, Exodus 21, 7, when a man sells his daughter, to which I wrote, excuse me, when a man sells what? There must be some mistake in translation. But no, sex trafficking is a form of slavery. It was widely practiced in biblical times. Okay, you know all the, 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 the kind of lines that uh, people like me <laughs> throw at you. So explain to us, what's the possible context in which this was acceptable or somehow the creator of the universe just didn't understand why slavery was wrong, uh, but Lincoln did. What? I mean, come on, give us the oh, kind of the rabbinical <laughs> explanation. Uh, Link, uh, Lincoln, Lincoln read a lot of Bible and he knew his o Old Testament very, very well. And, uh, and his astonishing flights of uh, biblical rec uh, 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 rhetoric um, were, were based on his recognition, as many, many, many people have recognized over, uh, uh, over the millennia, that uh, the heart of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the biblical moral teaching is the evil of the enslavement of the Jews in Egypt and the justice, justice and righteousness of their, their liberation. Now, Martin Luther King didn't make this up. This is things. The, the, this is the the way that uh, that the Old Testament Hebrew Bible has been understood for thousands of years. We we Jews not not only do we have Passover once a year in order to commemorate the uh, uh, the uh, the freeing of our people from 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 slavery, but um, we we refer to the liberation of uh, uh, slavery from Egypt in all of our holiday liturgy. Uh, in in, uh, in daily prayers. Okay, so so I, I I don't think that that the Bible is short on understanding the the evil of slavery. On the contrary, I think that if you if you look at the um, medieval arguments about um, uh, uh, about about enslaving peoples, um, for for example, the, the 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 arguments over the Spanish and Portuguese con conquests in the New World and the enslavement of of uh, uh, Native American peoples, I, I believe that uh, you will find that uh, the the debates were basically um, uh, advocates of Aristotle, who uh, held as Aristotle did that 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 people are that certain people are 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 sl in are to be enslaved because they're slaves by nature, which can't be fixed, as opposed to uh, those uh, those popes and bishops and and and, uh, and and Christian leaders who relied on the Old Testament to show that all human beings are in God's image and that slavery is wrong. Now, with regard to the legal passage the passages that you're talking about, um, look, I, I, I. I hope that I'm I'm not going to disappoint you with what I'm about to say. Um, the, there, uh, the 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 particular laws that you find in uh, in the Bible are recognized by Jews as having been the product of their time, and the way that they're generally understood and interpreted is that um, that the uh, improvements that are are placed in uh, in the Hebrew law, in the Mosaic law, are, uh, are are all in the direction of making the life of the slave, giving him new rights, him or her, and making the life of the slave 
better than what it was before. There's a there's a a, a really good book about this by by Jerry Unterman uh, called Justice for All, which compares. Um, it came out a few years ago. It compares the Mosaic Law to the laws of all of the surrounding nations in order to understand, like, what exactly is happening with with the way that slaves are being treated, the way that women are being treated, and his his knowledge is is extremely broad in in these uh, um, ancient Near East. Uh, 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 legal systems and and I I think that what he comes with is unequivocal that the the principle of alleviating the burden of the slave is the main thing that is uh, uh, that is taking place and it's the beginning of a historical process that that is uh, entirely under the the shadow of uh, the ancient Israelites considering slavery to be evil. Yeah, I see that. I, I mean, for, okay. for example, uh, to, if, to, for example, yeah, if you please. if if uh, if a, if a, if a master if a master uh, knocks a tooth out of his slave's mouth, he has to set him free. Okay, that that that's that's biblical law. You're not allowed to abuse your you're you're not allowed to abuse your slaves. Where, you know where does that exist elsewhere? Okay, so that's an improvement. <laughs> but again, if if the idea is that the you know creator of the universe dictated or inspired this holy book with moral truths. How come he didn't just come out and say, look, you guys are really screwing up here. This is really not what I had in mind. Thou shalt not enslave thy fellow humans, period. And by the way, you shall not molest young children, Catholic priests, while you're at it. And maybe a few other things like that, that, you know, we moderns take for granted. And, you know, so why isn't that in there? And your answer seems to be because that's not that God didn't dictate anything. It's a historical document. No, I didn't. Written by people. I didn't say that. Well, maybe uh, look, maybe the, you didn't the, apply the, that. The, no, the, maybe the, I'm hearing the the, the, the Jewish, uh, the Jewish, the Jewish God is certainly a God who acts in history. <laughs> and if you're looking for the the law of Moses to be, um, uh, like a uh, a Christ uh, a a perfect crystalline structure that makes no compromises with human nature or human society at the time, you're you're going to be disappointed. That's not what there is there. Okay. Um, yeah, the yeah. the 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 idea of, of of a perfect world dictated by God uh, appears right up front in in Genesis at the beginning of Genesis. Uh, God creates exactly the world that He wants. Right. The 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 ideal exists in in the first chapters of Genesis, and in the first chapter of Genesis, that ideal is a world in which uh, human beings uh, do not eat anything other than fruit and vegetation, and that animals eat nothing but vegetation. It is a world that is entirely devoid of any kind of violence, and uh, and that you know that's the ideal. That's what God wants. But um, uh, the the biblical narrative does not proceed as though God has the power to do that. Okay, and you you if if you uh, detect a a question about whether God is all powerful. That's in place because in the Hebrew Bible, what happens is that God keeps creating, and human beings and and even to an extent the animals keep refusing to do what it is that He tells them to do. And the crisis comes with that you know that uh, story of the of Noah and the flood, when God looks at the world and says. They're not living the way that I asked them to live. Um, they're living a uh, a life of oppression and violence, and he wants to destroy the whole world because it's so evil. And by the way, that this is this is very very much in keeping of the God of the Old Testament that he he is enraged by the imperfection of the world that he created, and uh, and he's tempted to destroy it, and he tries to. Um, to save it uh, by killing everybody off and starting with you know just just uh, Noah and his and, and and his sons and their families um, and you, you know the story and they, they they're on the ark and they get off the ark and the whole world is destroyed when he get when Noah gets off the ark he does two things one 
is he takes all these animals that were on the ark and he, he, and he, and he slaughters them uh, in sacrifice to God, which is not something that God asked for. And the other is that uh, that he plants a vineyard and starts getting drunk and and behaving, you know, like a derelict and worse. And God looks at that and he says, all right, this, you know, I give up. There, the, the, there's, there's no choice. There's no way to repair man. That's when God says, Yetzelev Adam Ramine Orav. God says, the, the thoughts of God, uh, the thoughts of man's mind are evil from his youth. He is indelibly, um, irreparably inclined to doing evil. And what happens after that is a, a succession, a, a, a series of compromises that God makes with man's imperfect nature because he decides he, do, he, he doesn't want to kill them all. And so the, that's, that's the genesis of the law, the, the, uh, the uh, creation of, of laws which compromise with man's character and are to be implemented by human beings and human societies in order to try to repair this extremely corrupt nature. You'll notice there's no, in the Jewish version, there's, there's no fall. Man was never perfect. There's, there's just, it, 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 it simply doesn't exist in, in, in Hebrew scripture. Man is not perfect. He's evil from his youth, and uh, and everything that we do to try to uh, to improve things is uh, is a compromise. It's never an ideal. It's a compromise with this uh, horrific condition. So I guess this would explain then why it took so many thousands of years for the abolishment of slavery until it finally became illegal yeah. in every country. Link, you know, Lincoln's uh, argument that, though was not that's biblical. The way I see it. He, I, yeah. As he wrote, as I would not want to That's live in a society in which I am a slave, so I will vote for laws that outlaw slavery. That's that, well, actually, what he said was, as I would not be a slave, I would not be a slave owner. You know, but that's a that's an argument. From, that's kind of a game theory logic. Right. It's a rational argument that it's a golden rule. It's, you know, the principle of interchangeable perspectives. I don't want this. I don't want you to do this to me, so I won't do it to you. And here's a passage that I, I quoted in my book from Lincoln. If A can prove, however conclusively, that he may of right enslave B, why may not B snatch the same argument and prove equally that he may enslave A? You say A is white and B is black. It is color then, the lighter having the right to enslave the darker. Take care. By this rule, you are to be slave to the first man you meet with fairer skin than your own. What do you mean by color exactly? You mean that whites are intellectually the superior of blacks and therefore have the right to enslave them? Take care again. By this rule, you are to be the slave to the first man you meet with an intellect superior to your own. But you, but say you, it is a question of interest, and if you can make it your interest, you have the right to enslave another. Very well. If he can make it his interest, he has the right to enslave you. Right? That's an enlightenment rational argument against slavery. Why is it wrong? That, to me, sounds like a better argument than no, it's, that, it's, well, it's, God, God made us all equal, or God said it's bad, or something like that. No, it's not. It, look, it's it, it's not wrong. It's just there is no chance that that uh, that that argument would have appeared and gained traction in non-biblical societies. I, I mean, it, the the the, um, the 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 original version of that argument uh, again is in the, is in in the laws of Moses. Uh, 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 you shall love the stranger because you were strangers in the stra in in the land of Egypt. Okay, that that when you see someone um, who you could enslave because he's a stranger and you could persecute him and you can abuse him because he's weak, you have to put yourself in his place and remember that you are you you are in the same position and therefore you're not allowed to harm him. Okay? It's it, it it's the same argument. It's got it it's got. 3,000, well, 2,800 years of, uh, of history in Jewish and Christian society before the Enlighteners come up and say, oh, uh, here, this is a, you know, a, a, an enlightened version. We can do it without scripture. And so, so the, the, the question that we face today is we did the experiment. 
we, we, we threw scripture out, not, not during the Enlightenment, but, but in, you know, after World War II. And uh, after World War II, we tried running uh, America and Britain and, and, and European societies um, on these rationalist arguments without the basis of scriptural tradition, which had previously backed it up. And what happened? What happened is that the, that the, uh, by pumping up um, the claims of reason, we opened the door for uh, all these Marxists who I knew very well 30 years ago in, you know, when I was in, in graduate school. All these Marxists were sitting around reasoning, and their reasoning was quite good. I mean, you, you know, you, you could find problems with their arguments, but the, the problem was not that they weren't reasoning. They were reasoning quite well. And they, they raised up generations of, of, of uh, neo-Marxists uh, based on, on reasoning by professors, and, and, and they've wrecked liberal society. They've wrecked it. And I, I have no idea how we're going to pull out of this. But w what we need to do is we need to, to, to uh, ask, why is it that these rationalist arguments, as soon as they were cut away from uh, the, the Christian and Jewish tradition and from education and Bible, these arguments did not succeed in convincing everybody, and in fact, were able to maintain their, uh, their, their dominance for 60 years. Christianity has been dominant in, you know, in its part of the, the world for 2,000 years. Liberalism on its own, 60 years it lasted. There's something, that there is something missing here that, 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 people who, uh, like, that, that people are calling for enlightenment alone without religion, without tradition, I, I think you need to open your eyes. I think you need to see, see that, that we're all really sorry that, that the experiment in, in liberal, liberal rationalism without religion has collapsed. It, it, it's terrible, well, but it's true. Well, well I don't, is it true? I mean, up until like the last decade, it's something on the order of 90% of Americans, you know, half liberal, half Derivative, believe in God. They most of ninety percent of those are Judeo-Christian, of some mostly just Baptist, Protestant, Catholic. Um, you know what? So what you're arguing is that even though they're religious and they believe in God and they attend church every week and so forth, it's not the kind of traditional conservative religiosity you're talking about from before. No, I, I'm I, no, I, I'm I'm saying that um, that. That Christian majority um, provided most of the fuel, uh, m most of the fuel for maintaining the ballast of uh, uh, of uh, uh, of the state uh, in the direction that you want it to go. In what you know, in in the uh, 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 the the rationalist direction that you want to go. Most most of the fuel for that was not provided by rationalist arguments. It was provided by inherited Jewish and Christian tradition in a society that was still at that time teaching Bible and, and, uh, and upholding inherited traditions, even if they were being erased from the schools. And that structure of a liberal rationalist um, educational system and legal system sitting on top of a religious fundamentally Christian society Survived sixty years, which in, in you know in the stretch of, of human history, if we're trying to be historical empiricists, th that that's the blink of an eye. Liberalism alone collapsed in the blink of an eye. And 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 I'm really sorry to say this. It's not you know there's nothing. It doesn't make me happy to to, to see what's coming now. Yeah, you it, it it may be coming, but maybe not. There's enough of us pushing back. Not just you, mm -hmm. but but many of us Enlightenment liberals are also pushing back against the far left woke kind of neo Marxism or whatever you want to call it. You know, John McWhorter calls it a, a kind of woke religiosity. It's not Marxism in the traditional economic class sense, but it's that dominant, right. uh, you know, power structure, oppressor and oppressed, and so on. That yeah, I I got that from your book. I agree with that. Uh, again, I, it could just be faddish. You know, I'm old enough now to remember hearing these kinds of, you know, America is on the verge of collapse every election cycle all the way back to, you know, when I first voted in 1972, you know. Right. 
<laughs> very, thank you very much for having me on. I, I, I'm, I, I'm really grateful for your time. Thank you. God bless.